Thank you. So welcome to today's side event, Women and Sustainable Livestock Transformation, Advancing the Agenda for Sustainable Development. I'm Donald Moore, the Executive Director of the Global Dairy Platform, and it is my honor and pleasure to be your moderator for today's session. We're going to start with a presentation from Shirley Tarawali. Shirley, as many of you will probably be familiar, is the chair of GASL, the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, and also the Assistant Director General for ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute. So Shirley, can I ask you to share your opening remarks, please? Thanks very much, Donald, and good day from me to everyone. A very warm welcome to this side event, which I understand is also being broadcast virtually. So welcome also to our online participants and thank you all so much for joining. I know some have rushed down from the session that's just concluded. I'm confident though that this is gonna be worthwhile because not least the topic aligns very well with the subcommittee's deliberations today. And as you've heard, I'm chair of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, uh, as well as Assistant DG at ILRI in Kenya. And GAZEL, the Go Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, is the host of today's webinar. So I'm going to say just a very few words about GAZEL, which began more than 10 years ago now, really as almost something of an experiment to bring together livestock sector actors seeking to foster a more sustainable future for livestock and for its contributions to sustainable food systems transformation. And from somewhat, we could call them perhaps ad hoc beginnings, today GASEL is a functioning and perhaps rather unique multi-stakeholder partnership with over 130 members who represent many thousands of constituents. They also cover every dimension of the livestock sector, from the smallest to the largest. They cover every region of the world and include every type of stakeholder. And we don't, as GASEL, attempt to replicate what any of these organizations or stakeholders does, but rather to provide opportunities to add together in these very different perspectives to embrace the change and harness the diversity to support greater livestock sustainability in all its forms. One of the primary ways that we work is through a series of technical networks, which we call action networks. These focus on topical issues, using a multi-stakeholder approach and seeking to tackle these complex, sometimes controversial issues that, for example, look very different in different parts of the world or for different livestock commodities or production systems, topics that cannot be addressed by any single stakeholder group alone. But as with many initiatives, governments, organizations in recent years, we've also recognized the importance of incorporating gender dimensions into everything we do if we're really to contribute towards development ambitions from our operations and governance to the multi-stakeholder meetings and to those technical networks I mentioned. In that regard, Nitya and a small team have led some assessments. They've engaged with other leading gender specialists around the world. And importantly, they've organized today's event to engage with members, to provide insights and options to help with the practicalities of including gender while addressing some of those often complex and challenging sustainable livestock issues. Because while, to me at least, there seems to be considerable consensus that incorporation of gender dimensions is important, if not essential, there remain questions about how. So what do we do about it? And I think that the diversity of examples we will hear about today will help in that regard. So it's also a great example of how GASEL's multi-stakeholder approach ensures that recommendations are actionable, that they're relevant to multiple stakeholders, and they encompass the diversity of livestock systems globally. To me, gender is not optional. It's integral to deliver sustainable livestock solutions 
that contribute to sustainable development. And the value added of GASEL's multi-stakeholder approach ensures that recommendations are actionable. They're relevant to multiple stakeholders and they encompass the diversity of livestock globally. Thanks to NITIA, to the GASEL support team, and especially to our speakers and our chair. Thank you for joining. I'm confident it's going to be worthwhile. Thanks, Donald. Fantastic. Thank you, Shirley. And welcome again to everyone in the room. And just so you're aware, we also have uh, a number of people joining us online. Today's session is intended to be interactive. So we do hope that you will have questions to put to our speakers. And there will be time allowed at the end of today's agenda for you to do that, as well as for our online participants to ask questions of us as well. But to get us started today, after Shirley's um, uh, inspiring opening remarks, we do have a mentee for you to participate in. And is that coming up on the screen? I think that's going to come up on the screen. Here we go. So if you scan the barcode or the uh, QR code on the screen there, you will be able to participate in the mentee and the question. Oh, look at that. Are they taking our photo, Shirley, or are they... Scanning the mentee, yeah, I think we must be scanning the mentee. Um, so the question that we would like you all to answer is we want to produce a word chart coming out of this meeting. And in your opinion, what are the contributions of women to live, into livestock production systems which are often overlooked? So what is it that we are overlooking when we think about the contribution that women make to livestock production systems? We'll give you a moment to enter into the Menti app, and then hopefully we'll start to see the names, the words coming up on the screen. I think some of you are quicker typers than others. Okay, Nitya, I think you're going to address us next. And Nitya and Gote is the, um, from Anthra. She's also the NGO cluster gender and the gender focal point for GASEL. So, and Nitya needs um, probably no introduction to many of you. And uh, we thank her for the work that she's put into helping to organize today's meeting. So Nitya is going to help us now with setting the scene for today's meeting. Nitya. Yes, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Donald, for the introduction. Thank you, Shirley. And thank you to the FAO team and all of you here this afternoon, taking a break from your lunch break, I think. Um, yeah, so just thought we'd set the scene because what we discussed today also feeds into what's happening in the Red Room upstairs. So um, we hope it's meaningful, it's useful. Yeah. yeah. So I have a small uh, slide presentation for you. I can do this. Yeah. So, towards a more equal world, definitely the world is not an equal place. All of us know it, but and large gender disparities still exist in many countries. And women face challenges such as no ownership of assets and property, limited access to services and resources, decision making processes, and marketing opportunities. I mean, many of you know this, but the need to write it is because the conditions can vary from country to country, continent to continent, so we just thought we'd like to have it here. Despite a lot of progress, we do realize that gender pay gap exists, and the UN and the FAO themselves are uh, conscious of this. And uh, despite the fact that today, compared to say when I was a veterinary student of veterinary science, many, many more women are in these fields of agriculture, of veterinary science, of animal sciences, agroforestry, range, rangeland management. So you see there's a big chain, many more women there, but the gender pay gap still exists. And in many societies, women are still considered weak and vulnerable. So they have to be empowered. You give them something and you, you think you can magically empower them. But that's not what we believe. We believe that this often leads to a misdiagnosis of the problem and you need to address it in different ways. And the real situation is something quite different because societies, as I said, are different and need to be, we need to understand this better. 
Um, I'm coming now to women in the livestock sector. We just saw the Menti poll and several things were uh, after six responses, which were flashed in big letters. We had many more coming and we could share them with you later. We find that the women play a crucial role in all the deliverables and action points highlighted in the multi-year plan of action, which is being discussed upstairs. For example, in the sustainable livestock systems, uh, systems for sustainable food systems, including food security, nutrition, and inclusive economic growth. We also have them in animal, public, and environmental health through the One Health approach, which I think is also being discussed this afternoon. And of course, the, the contribution of women to natural resource use, climate change, and biodiversity. It's also known that in the lower and middle income countries and in marginal areas, the contribution is perhaps much higher, especially in areas where other opportunities do not exist in livestock rearing and agriculture are the primary sources of income. It's also very, very uh, important in areas where men have to leave because of migration. For example, in the Himalayan Hindu Kush mountains in countries like Nepal and Bhutan, men leave uh, those societies going leave on migration to search for better jobs, and the women are left, left behind with the additional burden of livestock care and of agriculture, adding to their burden of also looking after the family and caring for the old ones or the young ones who stay behind. Um, so in, in, with this background, what we believe is that for sustainable livestock transformation to happen, we need to correctly analyze the situation in different countries and production systems and look at barriers and constraints which prevent equal participation. We'll be having a session on this this evening at the COAG, but we, and we'll also have presentations today which highlight some of the different approaches. And this side event, we want to highlight the contribution of women's initiatives. We want to look at solutions, what can be done, and, enter, and so we look at solutions and enterprise and sustainable livestock transformation that contributes to development out outcomes. We also will share a few approaches which may not be the best approaches so that we understand perhaps the roadmap and the pathway where what needs to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nitya. And our next speaker is Lavinia Scudero. Uh, Lavinia will be known to many of you as well. Lavinia is part of the Secretariat for Gassel, um, based here in, uh, in Rome. She is a researcher and a consultant with Gassel. So Lavinia, can we hand over to you? just while we get Lavinia's slides up. Yeah, oh, thank you, Donald. Um, yeah, hello, everybody. Um, this is a research that is mainly coming from the Royal Veterinary College and is part of the One Health Poultry Hub. So in particular, is looking at consumption with gender lenses and linkages to the food system, in this case, live, livestock food systems. Um, so as a bit of background, we are in a scenario where the industrialization of the livestock systems are very well known. Um, production of meat in particular has increased dramatically over the last 70 years. However, we still face in the world uh, a persistent triple burden of malnutrition with inequalities in consumption. And in here, I'm bringing this case study from poultry in India, where poultry is one of the biggest livestock system production um, in, in the country. Um, and we see that in the last 70 years, poultry production has increased uh, dramatically. However, if we look at consumption, India is the green one in, in the graph. We see that compared to the countries in, in the region, uh, consumption is still very, very low, although it has increased. So using national data, there are like more than 100,000 observations. Uh, we see that in 20 years, there has been a jump from households consuming poultry. Uh, however, just 10 years, this is from the latest data from 10 years ago, we see that still there is a huge number of households not consuming both chicken and eggs, despite this increase in, in production. Um, and despite this jump, we see that the consumption per, uh, per capita per month, although it increased, has been very marginal, especially if we compare these figures to the Western world. So this is a bit the background of the research, and we're trying to understand what are the driving of, of consumption. Um, a bit at macro level, using the national data, we see that the market concentration uh, of poultry 
has been driving this consumption. Particularly consumption is higher in the south where the market has been concentrating, at particular at urban level. We see here in, in the map of India that um, that's where the concentration of the market is and that's where consumption is higher. Uh, of course, household socioeconomic background also has a big influence, particularly income, but also caste and religion. And then at qualitative level, we talking with consumers, um, they were emphasizing that the industry has been providing poultry in a very diversified way. Um, that is very convenient for them at the moment now, particularly poultry um, as called away from home. So poultry restaurants, etc. Um, However, with this increase in, in, in production, particularly the, the intensified one, the consumers were very much aware of the health threats from that, and particularly women. So we have this women saying, because of injection in the chicken, and she meant antibiotic use, I've drastically reduced my consumption. So these are, bit, are the macro level uh, drivers. And then we were quite interesting into seeing and to quantify the differences between women and men. So we brought the survey at intra-household level, at urban level, and we actually identified that women consume less than male here. Um, this is just from one city, so it's, it's not applicable at all country level, but we see that in Chennai, uh, women consume 0 point time less um, poultry than ma the males. And through the survey, we look in a quantitative way, we found the drivers of this consumption and this gap. So there is household composition, gender norms, um, the task within the households that male and female have, this is also contributing to difference in consumption, as well as what we call food value, so the value of food beyond just economic terms. So a bit of a wrap up, um, the evidence of this research, which is quite important, is showing that there are gender disparities in consumption where women face uh, greater barriers to accessing food compared to men, due to socioeconomic inequality, but also cultural norms. Uh, from a societal barrier point of view, uh, we see that there are cultural structures as well as norms that prioritize men over women in consumption. Uh, this is in India, but is applicable to other countries as well. Um, that's why you need a more local approach to study this consumption. As well as in terms of economic inequality, uh, we have this concept of food work and food care, uh, where we know that women generally do all the tasks uh, around food uh, preparation, uh, food cooking, etc. But this is a well-known unpaid work. So the women don't have the money to, to buy the food or, or to access the food. However, they find ways to, to show the care towards the family by, although preparing food, uh, giving better food, uh, particularly from a quality point of view, but also in terms of quantity, to all the household members. And normally these are men. Uh, so the takeaway of the research are quite important because it shows that even though there is an increase in production, this necessarily doesn't translate in improved nutrition for everybody. Um, so the, the policies here and the key takeaway will be that to achieve this nutrition for everybody, you should um, tackle these social inequalities and as well as uh, cultural barriers. And yeah, just thanking all the institution behind this research. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Lavinia, for your presentation. Um, again, reminding all of the audience that you will have an opportunity to ask questions. So make a note of the questions you want to ask our individual speakers, and we'll give you that opportunity towards the end of today's session. So our next speaker is Bernard Kimuro. Bernard is with the government of Kenya, and he is a, a member of the public sector cluster at Gassel, and he's going to talk to us about the multi-stakeholder approach with examples from Africa. So Bernard, over to you, please. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Donald. Uh, I don't have a presentation. Uh, first, I, yeah, um, I want to appreciate uh, the fact that the government of Kenya is part of this uh, side event and also uh, uh, to say that uh, we'd be very happy to make a contribution on what we're doing as a government of Kenya and also maybe give a perspective about uh, what is happening in Africa in regards to issues of uh, multi-stakeholder platforms, uh, especially in livestock. Um, in Africa, we have a saying uh, that if you empower a woman, you empower society. <clears throat> and I think this is what, what is being said uh, almost globally. 
Uh, for Kenya, it's the same. Uh, we talk about if you educate a woman, you have educated society. So it's the role of women and the importance of women in society is acknowledged uh, from uh, especially the government. Um, uh, with respect to the uh, agriculture and women, and if you look at Africa, if you talk about issues about labor, I saw what was presented here in, in the Menti. Uh, livestock care, labor, uh, invisible labor, and all those kind of things. In Africa, when you talk about agriculture, the inputs in terms of labor uh, to agriculture, and especially livestock, varies between 45% to 70%. Um, uh, in Kenya, it's the same. Uh, so we look at uh, women uh, supporting about 70% of the labor that is uh, required. Um, however, if you look at the input that is provided in terms of the labor and other services against the access that the women get uh, from the activities they're involved in, especially livestock, there's a big disparity. Whereas they provide a lot of uh, uh, care inputs into, into, into uh, production, livestock production, access is still uh, limited. Yeah? i give you an example. In the Maasai of Kenya, the man is the holder or the owner of the livestock. Yeah? That's, so the only thing that the woman can be able to access is issues around the milk. One good thing about the Maasai is that, yeah, the man owns the animal, the milk is owned by the woman. That also gives some sort of leverage for the woman to be able to empower the household. So, it's, uh, so we have um, issues of access in terms of uh, the benefits that are coming from, uh, uh, from the livestock care production. Uh, so the biggest challenge that we have in Africa is in terms of the inclusion of the woman, uh, in, in social inclusion and, and the fact that they are not able to benefit from the, the, the activities that they are involved in. Um, I just wanted to say in Kenya we have an example of an MSP that actually empowers women. We have an association called the Women Farmers Association of Kenya. Yeah? Uh, and this is an umbrella organization that actually supports all individual and uh, women of outstanding qualities as well as women who are in groups to be able uh, to reach some set of uh, sort of equality and uh, equity within society realizing that there, there, there is still uh, quite a bit of uh, exclusion yeah so uh, uh, this this particular association is is has been in existence for the last 20 years and 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 for the livestock sector uh, for example, we are working with them through the what you call the Climate Smart Agriculture uh, uh, multi stakeholder platform, where they are a member of the, of the MSP and they are contributing in terms of uh, two levels. One, in terms of policy and advocacy, the, this uh, women association has been able to leverage on inclusion of uh, women as part of the MSP. Uh, I'm one of the founding coordinators of this uh, CSA MSP. And, 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 and one of the things that uh, we have seen as very powerful in terms of inclusion of women uh, 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 associations is the fact that they've been able to lobby to have one thematic group which was missing from that particular uh, Climate Smart Agriculture MSP uh, 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 platform. So uh, what, what essentially I'm saying here is that having a women association which can actually be able to lobby and advocate uh, for inclusion of uh, women is a critical aspect that is uh, that can change or transform society so that is one of the things the second thing is uh, the women association of kenya being an umbrella organization has also been involved in projects and programs that are actually being implemented uh, I give an example. We had a project uh, which was called the Kenya Climate Smart Agriculture Project and also a national agriculture and rural inclusive uh, project where they required uh, education of women and households using what they call uh, the gender uh, transformative approaches. They call it the girls approach. Yeah, The best um, association that would have done that is the, uh, what you call the WUFAC. So what they did is, because they're already involved in the MSP at, at the national level, 
they were also given the task of training other women on issues of gender transformative uh, approaches, which, which then changed the approach of the household on how they look at livestock and the benefits uh, that actually uh, are arising and how they can be shared within the household. How do we plan, for example, as a, as a household? Yeah? How do we uh, get the benefits? And how does it benefit the whole household? So that is the other thing. So in addition to the lobbying and advocacy, they have also been used in terms of uh, uh, building the capacity of the women uh, in, 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 uh, in, in transforming households. And then finally, um, the, other, the other important thing about the association I'm talking about is the fact that uh, on their own, they have also been able to raise resources, mobilize resources to come up with projects. Now, what have these projects done? One, the projects have been able to uh, support women groups going to entrepreneurship. Uh, the association has also done um, mentorship programs, which are also very critical. And then finally, they are also uh, creating networks. Yeah, uh, creating networks with other new projects which are being brought. And, uh, and this is also helping to transform uh, uh, some of the women, uh, yeah, uh, some of the women uh, groups that are there. I give an example, just one example. We have, as a result of this kind of resource mobilization, we are one of the groups in the Maasai region that is actually gone into value addition and uh, milk chilling, uh, which is really supporting almost 10,000 women uh, in, in, in the value addition uh, uh, process. So my key takeaway is that ensuring that women are in uh, multi-stakeholder platforms is very critical because it then leverages on uh, policy advocacy, uh, going into household transformation, and also uh, uh, the, the issue of entrepreneurship and mentorship of, of the young women in society. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Um, our next speaker is going to be online, and that's Jacob Onyama. Uh, is Jacob online? Can we bring him up on the screen, please? He is a veterinarian and an expert in food security, nutritional, and natural resource management. And he's going to talk to us about women entrepreneurship in, and camelids. So Jacob, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, let me just uh, share the screen. Uh, can you go see the screen? We can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about women entrepreneurs and camels. Uh, this is a, a topic that we, we selected specifically because of what we know about Camels and women. Let me just, I'm trying to make this screen bigger. What happens? It's even smaller. I'm looking for this. Yeah. So uh, we talk about entrepreneurs and camels, camelids. Yeah, if you've talked about, if you have, uh, my colleague who has just spoken, Bernard mentioned about uh, women in many societies, uh, uh, the, especially pastoral societies, they are mostly allowed to deal with milk and the products, but uh, often we hear about them being more, uh, I mean, the animals being more in control of men, which uh, on, the self, on the face of it, one can say that, but sometimes when you look at the different communities, you will notice that there are certain uh, roles that women play that are very important for uh, animals. As you know, camels are big animals, and uh, often they are people. They say they are, because they are big animals, they are mainly for uh, controlled by men. And yet, women actually play a very crucial role in the actual breeding and caring of these animals, uh, as we'll see in in in, in uh, several examples we have. For example, in Pakistan, the Malkada uh, women have been known to be breeders of the best camels to the level that they actually we have the highest production of camels, camel milk in this in this region. And this is because in this in, the, in this community, actually women own camels, as they receive those animals during the dowry. For example, when they get the, when the dowry is paid. They, they, they receive the animals. And as you've heard, 
previously, women also play a major role in marketing or selling this milk um, during migration. And they're also important in caring. They have a caring attitude. They use camels. Previously, they used to use camels for as 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 uh, for during my migration for carrying, but now they have moved to using donkeys because of the they are fish that they wish that the camels should not be overburdened. What is happening? It's not moving. Okay. In Rajasthan, uh, if you've been in those in those communities, you realize that sometimes you have cow dung uh, on the streets. Uh, because animals uh, somehow move around. The women actually collect this ma manure at night at the resting place of those animals, and they use that as an income. And they sell it for cash uh, for the wheat farmers. At the same time, women uh, use, when they are using pack animals, they take the lead. They're actually the ones who lead the movement of the pack animals. That's in Rajasthan, India. In Mongolia, women are decision makers. Our experience have seen that uh, women actually in Mongolia make decisions regarding camels. For example, in, in this picture, the lady on the left uh, told us that the domestic animals, um, the domestic female, uh, they use those, they use the Bactrian wild animals, wild Bactrian camels to, 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 to improve the vitality of the, their domestic animals. There's a colleague of ours who has shown that actually a woman can take decision on moving from different, uh, moving the family from keeping other animals and uh, being able to switch to camels. Having problem with this. Sorry. In Kenya, the example that uh, various colleagues said. Actually, in several counties in Kenya, Siolo, Mandera, and Garissa, women have come up with cooperatives, and they are the major market. Uh, they are the major entrepreneurs in camel milk in all these counties, and it's growing. This kind of approach is growing. They actually have a system of bringing the camel milk from all those places to the to the central place, and sometimes up to Nairobi, and they market them. In Ethiopia and Kenya also, uh, previous consumption, uh, assumption has been that women don't really uh, play a major role in camels, but we realize that actually in milking, in this, some communities in pastoral areas, milking process and even caring of the calves is in the hands of women. And you see that's the, the production's beginning of the livestock. You know, calves caring is the source for the future generation of the animals. Okay, we have individuals also. For example, uh, Nancy Abadre Hamen is actually the first woman entrepreneur who was able to find, to create a, a, a camel dairy in Mauritania. And she sells so many products uh, of camel milk. She's the first to start packaging camel milk and selling. Another lady, Augusto de Lacy, she she's an American based in, uh, in uh, Emirates, but she decided to, to, to promote camel milk and actually calls them the healthy food from camel milk powder. Or in other words, she calls it between pipes. And, and this is an example of individuals within the women uh, society, in the women groups, come, taking up the challenge of being leaders in, uh, in livestock. So, the, in conclusion, actually, we want to say that many inspiratory appro inspirational approaches to camel development has been led by women. And we also want to say that camel women leaders in developing and market, are very important in developing and marketing camel based products. And in doing so, they are contributing to the livelihoods and welfare of the community and families, as well as the camel pastoralists. So how do we support them? Well, we need to realize that women are family oriented and see them family as a unit in which both husband and wife need to be consulted. We also need to, to understand that even if women 
are not the public face of the community, they often pull strings behind it. And so when you design projects that are not oriented at racing efficiency and performance, but elect, reflected, reflect or a caring rather than a commercial approach, that's the approach we should take. We should focus more on reflecting on the caring aspect rather than first looking at the commercial aspect, which is usually in the domain of men. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jacob, for your presentation. And we should all celebrate that this is indeed the International Year of the Camelid as well. So our next speaker is Lucia Garbaldo. She is with the Weekend Gender, or I should say she is the Weekend Gender Coordinator at FAO. Weekend is a platform for women's empowerment in dryland regions, and it's based within FAO. And Lucia is going to talk to us about partnerships and networks, we can and more. So Lucia. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to, to be here to contribute to this interesting panel. Um, do, do we have the PowerPoint? Ah, okay. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Otherwise, I can share later, no problem. I can share later, no problem. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm going to tell you why and how the community knowledge practice we can works for sustainable grazing livestock transformation, building sustainable rangelands and working towards SDGs, in particular one, five, six, and seven. Uh, we can is a community platform dedicated to strengthening women's agencies in livestock, dry lands, and agro pastoral systems. And it counts more than 250 volunteers members from 31 countries. Uh, the members are mainly representative from grassroots organizations, pastoralist communities, policymakers, researchers, and also other stakeholders, even FAO colleagues committed to promote gender responsive approaches in dryland and rangelands. Um, we can facilitate connections among women and diverse networks, and we want to create a virtual safe space. So we want to create this virtual space and time for women to exchange, to learn each other, to share their knowledge, to share their own uh, uh, successful experiences, best practices, methodologies, uh, always related to gender responsive strategies. So together with the members, we prepare knowledge sharing events, we uh, prepare training um, designed to build up on their own competencies and strengthen their leadership, policy, advocacy, and gender mainstream skills. So I would like to share three uh, reasons why we, the Wicked community can be a key to securing development outcomes in livestock and agro pastoral systems. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have the pictures, but we can, um, for example, in the case of our member Dunia from Lebanon, from a remote area in Lebanon, in the Beka region, she founded an organization called the VADA, and she started working on a multi-country research and program on pastoralism and uh, livestock after some exchange with the other members. So before, she worked only on tourism, rural, sustainable development, but after these exchanges, she learned new ways to work. She shared and learned from others new ways, and uh, um, she started this research. So again, here, access to information is key, and access to information is powerful. Second reason, uh, we can, it's a catalyst for supporting women to upscale the knowledge and practices from the local levels, from pastoralist communities, from uh, their own small uh, organizations, up to the global stages, up to the global advocacy arena. So, um, and, and this is fundamental to promote transformation also in the international opportunity that the um, activist has to negotiate 
and to advocate for gender responsive policies. For example, Kenza uh, Bemusa from Morocco. Uh, she is an environmental youth activist and uh, so she was at the beginning like observer at this convention, for example, UNFCCC uh, or in the, at uh, UNCCD uh, COPS. And now she became official negotiator, so a delegate from her own country to advocate for gender responsive and youth policies at UNC UNFCCC COP28. So, when she, now she sits at the decision-making tables, she advocates for gender responsive policies and she has the power to change realities. The third uh, reason that I want to share with all of you is uh, the weekend methodology. So I could talk for hours about it, but just in a couple of points. Uh, since 2021, it's, uh, it's been a powerful tool to upscale uh, pastoralists and rural voices because we want to facilitate this virtual space um, and give them time to emphasize the collective value creation to learn each other and build, again, build up on their own women's competencies and innovative solutions. So, um, and this strengthens the leadership recognition first in their communities. So first at the local level where there are and there are actives and also at the national and international levels. Um, lastly, I would like to mention three cases from the network. Uh, they are working directly on women's innovative solutions in their pastoralist communities. First, Grace Corey from the Pastoral Women's Council in Northern Tanzania. Uh, the organization transforms Maasai pastoral women from, unfortunately most of the time, passive observers to active leaders in decision-making, land rights, and by utilizing socio-ecological models, community dialogues to reshare harmful uh, norms, and women's rights and the leadership forums. So these forums, in, and these small groups enable women to freely express their opinion, to freely brainstorm their own solutions, to exercise negotiation skills, and again, to advocate um, concretely in their own uh, context for gender responsive policies. Uh, regarding innovative solutions, uh, our member from India, uh, Bhavana Desai, from Pastoral Women Alliance, is using technology for knowledge dissemination. So she's using GPS to monitor and disseminate indigenous pastoralist knowledge for more efficient grass development, storage, breed, conservation, and vaccination. And when you have access to resources and access to technologies, you can better manage, of course, livestock systems. Regarding food security and nutrition, um, in another Maasai community uh, in Tanzania, uh, Sara Pima, she founded this organization called UDEFO, and she's using different strategies, including diversified grazing management, uh, for example, implementing rotor grazing to allow pastures to regenerate, ensuring livestock assets and nutritious forests throughout the year. A different way to diversify water assets and management. So they developed reliable water sources through wells and dams to sustain livestock and vegetation during the dry seasons, because of course it's a very uh, dry land area. And, uh, and this is crucial to maintain animal health and nutrition. Um, concerning supplementary feeding, they provide nutritional supplements during drought, ensuring livestock receive essential vitamins and minerals to maintain health and productivity. Uh, then they also work on veterinary care, so they establish regular veterinary services to monitor um, animal health, provide vaccinations and treat disease promptly, safeguarding livestock nutrition and overall the well-being. These are just three cases and options that they shared currently in our, during our meetings. And I mentioned these three cases because they demonstrate women's innovative solution. And with the specific data, uh, even better, sex disaggregated data and access to relevant information 
the public policies can be developed and this public policy can take into consideration women's strategic needs. Not only women's practical needs, but also women's strategic needs in livestock and pastoralism. So uh, let's recognize the contribution of women and um, the contribution women can make to delivering sustainable livestock solutions and support them to sit at the right places, for example, in the advocacy spaces to advocate for gender responsive strategies in grazing livestock and agro pastoral systems. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Lucia. Um, our next speaker is back to Nitya again, um, who I introduced earlier, so I won't reintroduce you, but Nitya is now going to talk to us about women's networks and initiatives in the livestock sector. So, Nitya. We have the... Thank you, Donald. Uh, so, Lucia has already set the tone for some of the kinds of initiatives that are there. So, I would like to share with you now... Oh, uh, yeah. Is it working now? Yeah, um, I would like, to, I need the, yeah. oh, thank you. I would like to share with you some of the kind of initiatives that have been happening globally where women have come together and looked at things differently. So here I, in 2010, in the town of Mera in India, there was the first global gathering of women pastoralists. It was quite a landmark uh, event because nothing like this had ever happened before and over a hundred people got together and from 32 countries and participated in this event uh, the goal of the gathering was to enable women from women pastoralists to participate equi equ equitably in decision making without, within their communities governments and other local national regional and international fora while also raising awareness of the specific challenges faced by women pastoralists in quickly changing social, economic, and ecological environments. Uh, at the end of the week in Mera, the participants agreed on something called the Mera Declaration. It's available online at this site, and it articulated their combined vision. So just to share a little bit about the Mera Declaration and some of the faces of the women who were present there from different countries, the women, for example, pledge to continue to live in a way that is environmentally sustainable and protect diversity and common resources for generations to come. They committed to continue to network and share best practices and lessons learned so as to build capacity amongst themselves and within the global community. As women, they said their voices were yet to be fully heard, but they had unique and valuable contributions to make to their own communities as well as the global community. The women agreed to work together with men, not by them, only within themselves, to build strong, equitable pastoralist societies, contributing to greater social equality within their families, their communities, their countries, and around the world. I've chosen this from Mera because I felt this was a fairly, um, very nice ambition that the women came together and said, and you can remove the word pastoralist and add women farmers, you can apply it to any context, any region, and I think it makes sense. So, but this Mera was an important uh, event that happened. Shifting now to the year 2026, and we have the International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralists, as has been declared by the FAO. Within the IYRP 20 working groups, there are several smaller working groups. I wear the hat of the coordinate, I also wear the hat of the coordinator of the gender working group, and that has been created. We are many, many members there. And we work, the Gender Working Group close, works very closely with women, social movements in Spain, in Argentina, India, Mongolia, and I forgot, also with Tanzania. Many more countries, we're looking at if there are networks of women working together like the ones that have been talked about before. Uh, Bernard spoke of some of them, Lucia spoken of some of them. Women getting together, forming their own initiatives, coming together and articulating what they see as a future they want for themselves and their livelihoods. We also, interestingly, in the working group, have members from several countries and disciplines. We have scientists, we have filmmakers, we have researchers, development practitioners, and pastoralists. So it's quite an exciting place to be working with because we have uh, dialogues across disciplines, across uh, continents, across geographical regions. The key message of the gender working group, and I have people who've worked on it, Pablo uh, Pedro is here. The future of pastoralism depends on a deeper understanding of gender in pastoralism. 
equit equitable and inalienable rights to access and use of land, natural resources, biodiversity, knowledge, and information. We believe that this is not only for women from pastoralist communities, but could apply to women from other societies as well. Farming groups, enhanced and equitable participation of women in research, policy making and governance related to pastoralism and rangelands, because we're also looking at rangelands, how they're used, how they're maintained, we're looking at across continents from right up from North America right down to Australia. So it's all there. 2026 has also recently been declared the International Year of the Woman Farmer. And that was declared just in uh, May, and that was announced, that was, an, uh, while the IYRP was a request from the government of Mongolia, this has been from the, uh, the United States. It's reaching out to groups of, and, and the IYRP group that we work with, we're reaching out to women farmers to see how we can collaborate together and take these initiatives ahead. We believe it is important that the vision and voices of women pastoralists and small farmers, and maybe I met some larger farmers as well, and included in the process of exploring new options for sustainable resource use, their governance and management. We're also talking about the Gazelle Gender Group, which we're all a part of. The, and I just wanted to highlight a bit about the multi-stakeholder approach. Within Gazelle, we've recently started on, on uh, highlighting issues to, to do with gender, but we work across clusters, seeing how a strong multi-stakeholder approach can help address issues of gender. So within clusters, we're trying to work with each cluster and see how that can be achieved. We also work with the Action Network, seeing how their work can look at gender concerns more closely. And I think some of them, for example, the one to do with grasslands, restoring efficiency, is really quite strong in this. We're also supporting the publishing of papers, organizing webinars and events such as this one, networking with other groups and partners within the FA, outside of the FA, with our partner networks, and to bring focus on gender aspects. So some resources here are colleagues from uh, also partners of uh, Gazel, for example, the Heifer Project shared some of their links with us. We can share them with you online afterwards. We're also working with SEBI, the livestock, uh, li SEBI, which Alexandra will speak to you more about. And also there's a livestockdata.org, which is also working very uh, closely with gender issues, seeing how disaggregated data, when it's across gender, can help get a better analysis of what's on hand. And thank you. So that's, uh, we would like to create an enabling environment for women to surmount existing barriers and find different ways to address their challenges. That's my key takeaway message. And that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nitya. Now we have our last presenter. So again, just remind you after the next presentation, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. So start thinking about what you would like to ask our presenters. And so our last presenter today is Alessandra Gallier. Um, she's Gender and Agriculture and Livestock Development with ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute. And she's going to talk to us about implementing a gender responsive program, initial steps and considerations to be taken. So with that, Alessandra. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm expecting the PowerPoint to be up soon. Perfect, thank you so much. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about um, what do we do next after all you've heard. Um, so what are really the, the considerations for next steps? So I'm just going to talk very briefly about gender equity in livestock. And then the back of the presentation is really about what can we do? What can we can be done in terms of data interventions, policies, evaluation of impact and institutional environment. And then just one slide on conclusions. So um, in terms of gender considerations in livestock, um, you heard a lot already, <laughs> just very briefly. Uh, we know that more than 1 billion people worldwide depend on livestock. And we also know that two thirds of the poor livestock keepers are women. We know that livestock provides a lot to uh, communities in low and middle income countries. They're good for nutrition. Um, they're good for you know, cultural and heritage reasons. They provide hides and hair man manure. They are very important buffer against financial risks. And particularly, they are a key entry point for women's empowerment. And this is for the following reasons. Um, livestock can generally be controlled by women more easily than other assets. So while women generally cannot control buildings, they cannot own la land or 
machinery that can indeed control livestock. Uh, livestock produced daily, and this is quite different compared to other crops. So, you know, you have eggs and milk every day, and women consider this to be extremely important <laughs> for their traditional role as nutrition providers. Um, also, li livestock are a mobile bank, and this is very important for people who do not have access to f formal financial services, women in most cases. And this means also that livestock can be sold in case of crisis, but also that the poorest farmers, and again women in particular, can build their assets through livestock. So they get some chickens, they start building the flock, and then they get the goats and keep going. And finally, something that the women we work with mention so often, is that what is good about livestock is that they can own the animals and just drag them with them in case of divorce. So it's an asset that they can take along. But for all of this to happen, for livestock to really benefit communities, livestock keepers or other livestock value chain actors need resources. Yeah? So livestock keepers need land, they need um, livestock, access to markets, access to uh, services, inputs, information, technology, whatever it is. And when you look at that with a, with a gender lens, we see that worldwide generally, particularly in low and middle income countries, men have access to more resources, they have more capabilities to leverage livestock to improve their lives. Women are affected by what we call gender-based disadvantage. So because they are women, they generally have less access to ownership of land. They usually control smaller species of livestock. They have usually access to some services and information, not so much technology and so on. The issue about gender-based disadvantage is that it really does not allow women to leverage livestock to improve their lives, vis-a-vis -vis all the potential that I mentioned above. So in a way, gender-based disadvantage is very much at the, you know, what hinders us to progress towards gender equality. At the same time, because as I said before, women are two thirds of livestock keepers, if women are disempowered, indeed the livestock sector will also fall behind. So in that sense, we argue that we need gender equality for livestock, but we also need livestock for gender equality and always with a gender lens. So then what can we do then? <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about the fact that we need data. We need to implement interventions. We need to work on the policy environment. We need to assess the impact of the interventions and the policies. And we need an institutional environment that supports one, two, three, and four. So in detail, we need to learn through data. We really need more gender disaggregated data. So it's very important that some of the surveys that are already being done start collecting gender disaggregated data so that we have a clear idea of who does what, who controls what, in which species, who takes decisions and so on. This is information that we do not usually have. And of course, with the, you know, with the proper gender lens, I would also argue that we need to include other key characteristics, maybe age, marital status, ethnicity, whatever is relevant in a specific community or country. It's also important that we implement some of the gender equity focused surveys. So we have surveys that are specifically working on women's empowerment, for example. Here I included the Women's Empowerment in Livestock Index, which is one of the tools that we developed at ILRI. <laughs> and another important consideration is, consideration is to combine the gender disaggregated service that I mentioned before with some of the more gender focused service. So that in some cases, for example, we compare ROMIS, which is assessing productivity of the animals, markets and so on, with the WELI. So you can also look at how women's empowerment relates to productivity, markets and so on. Together with uh, disaggregating gender, I strongly believe and argue that we also need to go a bit beyond that. So it's not just who does what, it's also understanding gendered constraints and opportunities, it's understanding what the priorities and the needs of women and men may vary, again, across other uh, individual characteristics that may matter, but it is very important that we understand the hows and whys, the gender dynamics and norms. So we really have to question, already, we really have to question how, <laughs> I'm, told, I'm being told time is over. Uh, we, already being, um, we need to understand, for example, why are men only going to the market? You know? Why are women only or mostly in livestock and so on? And here you see some of the frameworks that we have developed to really look at some of the G key gender considerations in livestock. And the one on the right is a global framework that we wrote with FAO and other partners that has just been published. 
so I'll hurry up because I'm being told I'm already over time. We need to implement development interventions. And this is really understanding that we need to have interventions that reduce gender-based disadvantage, that address constraints and leverage the opportunities that we have identified through the data. Some of the tools, such as the WELLI, help you identify domains of disempowerment that you may want to address through the intervention. So which are the main contributors to disempowerment that we need an intervention to focus on? And of course, we need to work on the social environment. We have to make sure that societies or communities in this case, or policy environments, are supporting the change. This is, a, sorry, this is an example of a project that we had in Tanzania. We went to the ground and we realized that we had um, brooders, private brooders, who had good breeds of chickens and they, had, they could not manage to expand their market. At the same time, we had women farmers who wanted to have improved breeds of chickens, but they didn't know where to get them from. So we worked on um, uh, supporting the, uh, the image of a vendor who was a woman who would buy from the brooders, sell the chickens to the farmers together with our inputs, and then also provide a market. And here you see what we talk about. We, we often provide a package of institutional and technical interventions. So here we had the business incubation intervention, genetics, social media for transformative approaches, and so on. You need to create a conducive uh, policy environment. This means really design and implement livestock policies that are intentionally supporting gender equity, but also make sure that livestock-related policies generally are supported by gender analysis. And here I put a picture of the livestock master plan. You may know that. It's a, 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 the livestock master plan supports governments produce roadmaps for growth through livestock, and we are integrated the gender component. <clears throat> And then we need to assess the impacts of policies and interventions. And you may be familiar with this framework that goes from the do no harm all the way to reach, benefit, empower, and transform. So it is one way of seeing how different projects can impact uh, women and men with a gender lens. Um, and this is very important, of course, to assess the impact of an intervention because we surely want to do the no harm. We do not want to increase gender-based disadvantage. We do not want to have unintended negative consequences of interventions. We also want to make sure that interventions are supporting the most disadvantaged, disadvantaged people. And finally, we want to make sure that we are really addressing the structural and systemic um, roots of the disadvantage. And finally, as I said before, for the first four steps to happen, we need to make sure that we have an institutional environment that supports gender equity. This really means work within your institutes. And this means that it is important that we engage with gender experts, possibly both women and men, that we develop the gender equity task force. And very often, these are just made up of junior people. We need senior people to be in there for them to have leverage. We need to have a dedicated budget for staff and operations. It is important that institutions adopt um, some of the gender tools, for example, the ones I mentioned before, just to, uh, to mention some. Uh, it is important to, have a de to develop a gender strategy that then can inspire and lead the institute, support multidisciplinary teams, and of course, build the capacity of non-gender staff and partners. So, Everything I said in, uh, in one last slide, uh, we know that more than one billion people world by, worldwide depend on livestock, and two-thirds of them are women. Their empowerment is key to progress on gender equality in livestock systems, and for this we need gender disaggregated data, qualitative and quantitative, gender responsive interventions, a conducive policy environment. We need to assess the gendered impacts of interventions and policies, and finally, we need an institutional environment that is conducive to this work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alessandra. That was a really good presentation, and you moved through it very quickly in the end. Thank you. <laughs> OK, and we now have opportunity for questions from our audience. And I did note that there are a couple online. Um, but I will start in the room here. So raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. I see Todd. I see um, down the back as well. Come to Todd next then. Um, if you would introduce yourself and if your question is directed to a particular speaker, we'll start with you, Pablo, but if your question is directed to a particular speaker, let them know. Okay. That. 
I'm going to, to use the excellent team of translators, so I'm going to ask in Spanish, if you allow me. Okay. Um, mi pregunta es para cualquiera, porque han hecho algunos comentarios, Bernard, eh, Jacob, uh, Lucía. Um, muchas veces hay que enfrentar o vivir situaciones de pautas culturales, particularmente de pueblos indígenas, que deben ser respetadas, pero que han tenido una razón de ser o tienen una razón de ser histórica, pero que, bueno, en el contexto actual significa una diferencia en, en, la, en la equidad entre hombres y mujeres. Entonces, como eso, nosotros en nuestro gran chaco americano, en Sudamérica, también enfrentamos esa situación muchas veces, eh, saber qué experiencia, de, me imagino, de diálogo con, entre hombres y mujeres, líderes varones y líderes mujeres, han, se han hecho para trabajar sobre esta cuestión que, eh, que a veces significa una, un choque entre el respeto a la cultura y las inequidades de género. Gracias. Okay, thank you, Pablo. And Todd, if we could hear your question too, and then we'll take both questions at once. Thank you. My name is Todd Crane. I'm a, a scientist at ILRI. Um, my question, I think, is directed at everyone, maybe except for Alessandra, who got at the topic at the very end. We've heard a lot about um, women's constraints, their opportunities, their perspectives, priorities, capacities, and agency. But we didn't hear very much about how do we engage men in addressing those, because gender is a relational thing. And, and if we're looking at uh, gender equality and, and gender equity, we need to address men's behavior, and men need to be a part of that. Fantastic. Thank you. So let's go to our panel then for responses to these two questions. And. Um, uh, Oh, did you not catch the question in Spanish? I didn't either, actually. So I didn't catch all of your question, Pablo. Can you give us a shortened version in English, possibly? I, I'm going to try. Um, we face sometimes that a cultural, uh, um, cultural. Uh, Pablo, say, say it in Spanish. I can translate. Okay. No, that, it, when, indige, when we work with indigenous people, we have cultural uh, pautas, uh, pautas culturales, uh, no? So that it had to be respect. We say, oh, we have to respect the culture of, of the indigenous peoples. But sometimes these, these uh, questions are, uh, pro it means uh, inequity, gender ine inequality. How do you deal with this, with dialogue, with men, women? What experience we have in this? How to, uh, is the, the question, perhaps Todd say, made a similar question. How you, we, you have experience in, in solve this inequality uh, based in cultural uh, history that sometimes have the, the problem with uh, indigenous people's rights and inequities and gender inequities. Uh, I don't know if you understand now my question. I, I, I can take it, sure. Thank you so much for the question. I think that's one of the essential, really, tensions that we are working with. Um, I would argue that some of the latest developments in what we've been doing, what we call transformative approaches, are trying to really deal with that tension. Transformative approaches in many cases, maybe I would argue most cases, are about engaging the communities to question um, the role of um, some of the traditions or what we call gender norms. So traditions that ascribe a specific behavior um, or uh, identity to some women and men. Um, and the idea is very much to engage communities to discuss together whether that specific tradition or norm is compatible with their culture, what are the pros and what are the cons. And this means that the communities themselves 
start thinking and discussing how to move forward. So I have a case in uh, Ghana, to give you an example, where one of the strongest norms we worked with was that women in the northern communities were not allowed to say or declare that they owned livestock publicly. Some of the women were looking after the livestock, but they could not say, this is my livestock. And this had huge implications because, because they could not say, this is my livestock, they could not claim the benefits from the livestock. So when the livestock was sold, they couldn't say, it's my livestock, therefore the money is mine, and so on and so forth. So we worked with Care International and they engaged community leaders, religious leaders, and all the community members to say, so, what are the benefits of this norm and what are the negative sides of this norm and they started to say yeah well in fact if the women could say that they own the animal and rear the animal and then sell it they could probably you know um, support the education of the children which they did and so on and then the question was very much is there a specific reason why this tradition exists does it go against your religion does it go against your culture and then the religious leaders were like, well, actually, not specifically. So there was a whole dialogue that lasted a few months. And then the religious leaders co concluded, oh, well, actually, there was no specific reason why that, that tradition or that norm was in place. And we actually see that there are more benefits to changing that uh, than keeping it. And so there was a huge uh, change in the, in the communities and so on. So this is to say there is a tension there. But I also think that by engaging the communities, there is a way for traditions to change towards more equity, which is a bit like, I would argue, cultures develop anyway. I hope this helps. Thank you, thank you. Now, we are running slightly short of time. There are a number of questions online. I'm hoping that, that the answer we got from Alessandra covered your point as well, Todd. I know you didn't want your colleague to answer it, but I thought it was a good answer, yeah. Um, in terms of the questions that we do have online, there is uh, one which is more about um, a follow-up to the meeting with, um, collecting names and et cetera. Nietzsche, we leave that for you. Um, a very quick one, perhaps for you, um, Shirley, in terms of how people can participate in Gassels. You want to just cover that very briefly? Sure, and that's again something we can, we can share uh, after the, the conversation today. Uh, we have a website, livestockdialogue.org. You can go there and find out more, uh, and you can write to us through that, and we can help support you to become a member of GASEL, um, which uh, we would love to do. Uh, there's no membership fee. You just have to basically agree to what we call a consensus that describes a lot of the multi-stakeholder process of working together. Um, so it's a very light membership process, let's say. And we'll follow up with Latifa afterwards. Um, there's a question for you, Lavinia. Um, could you describe in more detail the gender norms that underlie the constraints faced by women in uh, consuming certain livestock products and what research methodologies did you use? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's divided in two parts. So the gender norms were about decision-making tasks in, in the house also regarding food provisioning, which, which include consumption, buying food, preparing. So a lot of questions are around that. Who does that uh, in the households, you or your husband? Um, and then the other part, the gender norms were more about if you are in a constrained um, economic situation, who do you give your food first? So your male, female, a lot of questions around that. And then how did we collect that? Um, first, we did a literature review in India, then we uh, tested the, the norms at local level, so through research assistant and, and the answer of consumers, we changed them slightly. Um, and then we asked both the norms to the man and the female to see whether there was a difference um, in thinking about it and whether they, they had different opinions, that that was the case. And then how do we used it in the intra-household surveys, we, we use uh, microeconometric methods. So we put these gender scales um, and we used um, factor analysis. And then, I don't know if you're aware of factor analysis, but then it, through statistical method, you can then construct gender scales. And those were then used in the regressions to test whether there was a difference in consumption as, after accounting for, for these scales. 
Fantastic. Thank you. And last question will touch on Lucia. This one's for you. And did you face any challenges in making your virtual platforms accessible to rural women? And any key insights you can share? If you could just answer that in one minute. Yeah, a lot of language challenges. Um, and but almost uh, uh, everyone nowadays has a mobile phone so i have noticed that um, they can connect and use their mobiles or at least we also work with um, some organizations that can that are going to the field and they have this connection to the field quite often so uh, when we want to collect uh, information data important needs from women and men from the communities we can uh, also uh, make sure that the, the rural groups informal groups in the countryside can express their own uh, points and needs and the people that are connected to the platform can also share their own voices and opinions so making sure that from the local level to the global there is like a, a communication and the needs are collected and taken into consideration so we can organize our advocacy actions accordingly Fantastic. Thank you. And look, um, I'd like a round of applause just for all of our speakers today. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. It was really well done. Now, showing that in the livestock sector we can be both adaptable and efficient, we're going to put a menti question up at the same time as we have our uh, final speaker summing up, and that's Lara Summers. So we have got a menti question up here. One key takeaway from this session today so if you just fill that in why Lara who is Laura sorry who is the um, with the government of Switzerland and is also the coordinator of the donor cluster for Gassel she's going to sum up then the key messages and takeaways from today so Laura thank you very much Donald so um, yeah today we heard uh, a lot of challenges are faced by women in the livestock, livestock sector be it being left out when it comes to ownership of land assets and property or having limited access to services and resources decision making processes and marketing opportunities i find this really thought provoking especially because two-thirds of global livestock keepers are women However, we also heard from different um, speakers um, from different initiatives across several regions in the world, which highlight the contribution of women's initiatives and, and enterprises in sustainable livestock transformation that contribute to sustainable development. Now, without intending to be conclusive, I wish to highlight from these inputs some key messages. So first of all, I heard it loud and clearly, addressing gender is not optional, it's integral to deliver sustainable livestock solutions that contribute to sustainable development. Or, as Bernard put it, if you empower women, you empower society. Second, acknowledge the diversity of livestock production systems that women contribute to globally. And systematically consider their unique requirements, especially when located in marginal and vulnerable areas which may be affected by climate change, war or um, other disruptive processes. Um, from Lavinia, we heard that um, the narrative of increased food availability doesn't directly translate into nutritional security and safety for all, especially for women, without addressing underlying socioeconomic barriers and or perceptions to consumption. Women often take over the care for family members, community members, and are concerned about animal welfare in their care. Um, therefore, livestock projects should reflect a caring approach towards animals and the environment, rather than only focusing on the commercial aspect. Further, also women should be consulted and should have decision-making power, be it concerning financial, veterinarian or other livestock-relevant livestock issues. And last but not least, a multi-stakeholder approach is key to support the active involvement of all relevant stakeholders, including women, to provide actionable solutions um, relevant for, to multiple stakeholders and um, encompass the diversity of livestock systems globally. This was nicely showcased today um, by this event uh, hosted by the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock. 
And um, there may be other issues that um, are of equal importance, um, and I, yeah, I unfortunately can't elaborate on these because the time is really um, a bit too short. Um, but I hope this event provided some food for thought to carry the issues forward within your own domain of responsibilities. Thank you very much. Back to you, Donald. And thank you to everyone for participating today. The mentee was really interesting as you were talking, Laura. Um, covered many of the points you raised. So the one thing I didn't see coming up on the mentee, which I think was a really interesting theme through a lot of our discussion today, was the need for data. And that underpins so many of the discussions we have in this, in this building, the need for data that is up to date, and particularly disaggregated data in terms of um, gender so that we can truly understand where we're heading. What is it, that famous saying by Peter Drucker, you can't manage what you don't measure, and so we need the data so we know where we're, what direction we're heading in. And with that, I would like to thank all of the panelists for today's um, event, and thank you particularly to our audience, both in the room and online, and to um, the speaker who was online as well. So thank you all, and I hope the rest of your conference goes well. Thank you, Donald. And a quick announcement for those of you in the room, there is some food on offer outside. I, I don't know where, but we'll find it. <laughs> no, I hope not. <laughs> but there is a little something outside. <laughs>